Welcome to Arise Shine. You know, in Isaiah 60, 1 and 2, it declares, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Darkness blankets the earth, and thick gloom covers the nations. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. you know, the Lord has called us to rise up and be radiant, making him evident in our lives, because his glory is rising upon us. We get to be a church alive with radiant glory, power, love, and radical faith, which is very true of our guests today, John and Sandy Halverson. Welcome. Well, <laughs> good to be here. We've known John and Sandy for years and have had the joy of watching them live their lives with great obedience to the Lord, demonstrating incredible faith and trust in him. You are amazing, faithful people. <laughs> love you. So we're very excited to invite you into our conversation today to encourage each other as we process truth and the Word of God and how we live that out in our everyday life. I'm Rebecca Ballard. I'm Kathy Hollanday. I'm Mary Gollinger. And I'm Barb Milbury. Please share this with others so that others can join us um, in the conversation. And after it's over, we will upload it to the Duluth House of Refuge video um, YouTube page. So the last few weeks we've been talking about hope and faith and how we live that out in our life. John and Sandy, you are living an incredible life of uncommon faith. Adventures like planning a church in Ireland, <laughs> prayer walking across Eurasia for two years, prayer assignments to the North and South Poles, John, and <coughs> walking America four times, including your most recent walk, which was from Miami to Seattle. Mm -hmm. All the while raising a family and pastoring a church and all that entails. <laughs> so, however, how do you, each of you feel God prepared you in your early years to embark upon such, I mean, really unknown territory <laughs> that required huge faith? You know, that's a interesting question. I, um, I haven't given that a whole lot of thought until recently. And I was asking myself, actually, what, what was I like growing up? And did my life experiences as a, as a young person or as a child contribute to our walk of faith today? And I, I think it has. And I, I was thinking, I'll give you an example. Um, I was in college, and I decided I wanted to ride a motorcycle out to... California, you know, something that most people would probably like to do. The problem is I had like 50, 54 dollars, did not <laughs> have enough money. And um, I still, I got on that bike and I just went, no, I, I'm not walking with the Lord at this time, at that time, I, I, but I just went and I, I thought, you know, it's going to work out somehow. And I ended up doing some odd jobs along the way and um, I got three quarters of the way through the trip and, and, and I was running out of time. I had to get back to college, and I sold the, 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 the motorcycle, and I had enough money to fly home. And, and so even then, even before I was walking with the Lord, there was this um, propensity in my life to, mm. to step out into the unknown. Now, when I gave my life over to the Lord, one of the first things that happened was that he was, he was asking me to make a full decision of submission, you know, submit my, my, my life to him. Once I did, the Holy Spirit really kicked in, and um, I just found that I had a, just a, I, I call it almost a childlike faith in believing God. If God says something, I believe it. Mm -hmm. And that, that was really we need that. a foundation, I think, to a lot of the, the faith exploits that we've been involved in over the years. Now, my story is a little bit different because, <laughs> well, when I first accepted the Lord, I just had a real sense there was an adventure lying ahead. I was 16 years old. I just had a sense of, oh, an adventure, an adventure. God's got something for me. <laughs> but I had no idea it was going to involve faith or even what faith was. And I had far more fear than faith going on. So when I, we met and we married, it was like a huge, like, wow, this guy <laughs> trusts God and I'm terrified, kind of more like that. So our first years of marriage, 
we had enough money to pay the rent, but we had to pray in the peanut butter, we called it. So we had to pray in the groceries because there was he was working for a Christian drug treatment program, uh, which you never go into the Christian ministry for getting rich. I don't know if any of you guys have done that, but that never worked for us. Christian ministry was always you go to give, 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 give. Mm -hmm. So we had years when we were first married <clears throat> Of praying in the peanut butter and literally I would watch the peanut butter jar and as it started to get low my fear level would grow and I'd cry out to God we had times again and again and again where he met our needs where you know there's no food in the uh, one example we were sitting down for a meal we were I had lettuce out of the garden we had lettuce and salt. There wasn't even any salad dressing. And there we were sitting at the table with two small children and it was gonna be the first meal that there wasn't a meal. It was lettuce and salt. And we're asking the Lord, Father, bless this meal. And a knock comes on the door and it's a friend of ours, our dentist actually, with two big boxes of groceries. And he said, no, I was just praying for you today and I felt like God tell me to go buy you groceries. And he comes walking in with these two big, all of his favorites, by the way. It just, <laughs> it just built my faith, it built my faith. And there were years like that where we <laughs> prayed things in for him, it was easy. For me, it was terrifying. But it was years of praying things in, and I saw that God was faithful. Um, I carried fear for a lot of years. We went and we were missionaries in Ireland for a while, and that oh, there, there are so many stories we could tell you about traveling around the world with three small children, zero, well, we had $200. We knew we were gonna go around the world by faith. We had $200, and, and we drove and we, got on a flight and over we went to England and it, it was like, why on earth, Lord, who would do this? But God had built my faith to, to just to that edge of the fear level that I was, okay, Lord, I'm willing to take the next step. He's so gracious to us, so gracious to us. We finally, at one point then, were pastoring a church in Ireland and a prophet came up to me and he had a, a gift for me and it was a bowl, a glass bowl and he said, I just want to tell you, your years of fear are over. God wow. is giving you this. And he had it filled with grapes. It was a glass bowl filled with grapes. God is giving you abundance. There will always be wow. enough. He handed it to me and something was broken. But that was probably 12 years into our walk of faith. I mean, it took years of my you know, pushing it up to the fear level and saying, okay, God, help me trust in you. And then God, he, always faithful, coming through, coming through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, where this guy, I mean, he just sort of walks in faith. I, I, it, for me, it's been a, a process, right? God is so faithful. He has never, ever, ever, ever not been faithful. Yeah. Well, yeah, so you're talking about <clears throat> foundations you know, the lead up to faith. Yes. And, mm -hmm. um, I remember, so I, you know, I'm, I'm now a Christian. I gave, I gave my life to the Lord in 1975, and I came across a book by a fellow named George Mueller, and um, mm -hmm. he's known as a man of faith. And I must say that I was, I was attracted to that book. I, 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 I mean, I literally lapped it up. I read it with great enthusiasm, and here I saw a man Kind of an average fella that had been a bit of a, a worldly man and he gave his life to the lord and he began to, he ended up working with orphans but he would believe for their provision and he told story after story about how god supernaturally intervened or provided and he never made an appeal for funds now while i was reading that book i felt captured by it i, I felt the lord was saying john i want you to live like that I want you to believe me for your provision and um, and don't be making appeals. And that really has been our, our life method since the beginning. We have believed God for our provision and we have, to my knowledge, we've never really made an appeal. And God has always been faithful to provide. And so, you know, so there, had, there was a buildup to our launching out in, 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 in almost a gift of faith that we that we've known for years mm -hmm. yeah it's you go to give you always go to give mm -hmm. and God 
provides. He gives back to you. You never go to people with the, oh, they're going to give to me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to get, I'm going to get what I need. No, you go there. He gives what you need. And then you go to people to give, right? Oh, right. So, so there's true. levels so of true. it. You know, first we, I learned to pray in the peanut butter, but, and, and right away there was travel involved in our lives. And, you know, I, I had to trust God for travel. We had to tr I trust God trusted God for the clothing for our children, trusted God for, you know, for every detail. And just as soon as I would say, okay, I can trust God now. I know he is going to provide the peanut butter. Something deeper would happen, you know, where you had to go to the next level of trusting God. He loves that adventure. Um, but somehow, as I was saying, that prophet in Ireland, when he came to me with that gift, this is the gift of prophecy is so powerful. Yes, when he is. came to me with that gift, something of the fear broke in in my life yeah. so that I was no longer struggling you know faith and fear can't live together That's right. and, you know fear is always going to dominate fear's got to go right and at some point as we're pursuing the Lord he's going to take us to the place where fear has to give amen it has to go and you stand in faith it is a joyous wonderful place to be Absolutely. because he never fails us Absolutely. <laughs> So John, you kind of answered my question made already, but would you say you have a gift of faith then? What the Bible calls a gift of faith? Well, I, maybe. Um, I, I think we have walked in, a, um, <coughs> in the gift of faith, um, or we've been walking in faith. I'm not quite sure how that works. Mm -hmm. But um, I do have a fundamental ability to trust God for provision and for travel, and um, and I think I think yeah, it built over the years. Um, mm -hmm. So I I'm, I'm thinking about George Mueller, and uh, I, I mean one story that really impacted me was the day that they didn't have I don't know how many orphans he had at the time, but it was probably maybe a hundred. I'm not sure. It was a lot, and they didn't have breakfast, and. Um, and so you know he feel he felt nervous about that, and he said to the to the um, to the orphans, he said, "Let's get down on our knees and pray." Mm -hmm. and I can feel it now, and they all got down and they said, "Jesus, we don't have breakfast, but you're the God of our provision. You're the God who provides manna in the wilderness." And there was a knock on the door, and a, a bread truck had broken down right out front, and 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 in those days, you know, the product could could you know ripen quick and so he said can you use whatever they had milk and bread and I don't know what all and anyway breakfast was just provided right there supernaturally and George Mueller's life um, was an example of that a testimony to that kind of supernatural provision <laughs> and um, a lot of money went through his hands he died without you know he died not poor but he died you know he he he, he didn't hold on to wealth or anything like that he just kept whatever came through he would give away or it, 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 um, you know, used to help provide for the orphans. And so that really impacted me. And so then um, it's like one thing builds upon another. And like David said, you know, he said, first I killed a, a lion, I killed a bear, or I killed yes. a bear, and then I car killed a lion. I can now take on Goliath. And we saw that principle. We have seen that principle at work in our mm -hmm. lives. It's like you go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, but believing for bigger bigger things and um, and it's never easy it's, it's like walking on water that never turns to ice it's just it's always an uncomfortable place to be but god has never once ever let us down no if he's if he's calling for it he pays for oh. it but barb there are different types of faith so you can have faith for one thing um, for instance i remember something that smith wigglesworth who used to raise the dead say i wish i had faith <laughs> like George Mueller, because he trusted God for finances. Yes. George Mueller could believe for finances. Smith Wigglesworth believed God for healings and raising the dead. Mm -hmm. Would you ever think Smith Wigglesworth would have said, gee, I wish I had faith. No, you would have said, <laughs> whoa, that dude's got faith. Yeah. He raises mm -hmm. the dead. Yeah. But he saw it was harder for him to trust the Lord for finance. He saw that gift in George Mueller's life. So I would say about <clears> us, <throat> there's faith for travel. There's faith for yeah. exploits. There's faith yes. when God calls this fella, for instance, to walk from Portugal to China. Psh, he's just he just knows it's gonna happen. Whereas me, I'm like, oh boy, 
<laughs> right? right? Um, but maybe not so much faith for m- mundane things, you know, like the phone bill. I can remember some years where he would <laughs> stew over, oh no, the phone bill, the phone bill, you know. Whereas, you know, walking from Portugal to China, no problem. <laughs> so there are levels of faith, or there's faith for different things that we can learn from each other, you know. Absolutely. Because you know, you have faith for one thing, you have faith for another, and yes. gee, I want, I want more faith. Mm-hmm. So going from this level to that level. So we tend, yeah, we tend to walk in a measure of faith. Now, the gift of faith is is unique, and I, I did experience that once for sure, probably more than once. But I, there, there was a day we were working with um, drug addicts, and um, um, one of the drug addicts in our program happened to be a former gang member from Detroit, and he was an ornery fella. And I don't know, he took, he took exception, exception to something that I did. Maybe I tried to correct him, I don't know, but he decided he was going to kill me. And, um, and he was also very good at karate. So he, he put his fist through the wall, and then he looked at me, and he was quite angry, and he said, no, I'm going to take your heart out. Now, this is all happening quickly. Now I'm I'm saying this because this 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 talks this exemplifies the gift of faith. So he's coming at me. All of this is happening really quick, and the Lord just spoke to me and he said this. He said, he said, you know, in the days of Hezekiah, he said, I, I sent an angel against the Assyrian army and I took down I think 183,000 people in one one night. Mm-hmm. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, if I can handle the Assyrian army, I can certainly handle this Puerto Rican. He was a Puerto Rican. And so, and then the Lord spoke to me again and he said, do not defend yourself. So I stood vulnerable, just stood wide open. He came at me, went, went to punch me, to kill me, and he hit an invisible wall. Now, during this whole episode, I'm completely at peace. I mean, I have a supernatural peace on me. That was a gift of faith. And so he hit this invisible wall. He came at me again, hit another invisible wall. And I simply said, Jesus rebuked you. And he flew, literally, didn't just fall. He flew to the ground and was pinned. He couldn't get up. We went and called the police and they came and they hauled him away. Now I look back on that as a, as a good example of the gift of faith because how is it that I could be mm-hmm. at peace in a situation like that Humanly speaking, that is impossible. Mm-hmm. So that's the gift of faith. Now, this other thing that we, we walk in is, I don't know, it's just a, maybe it's a gift of faith, but it's not, the gift of faith is usually for one specific thing. Yes. We walk in yes. this, this, this thing of faith, and I think it's just a um, fundamental belief that God is going to provide, which I believe he put in my heart. Yes. So if he calls you to do something, mm-hmm. he'll provide. And we've, we've never seen him let us down on that, ever. I have a question that when Sandy was talking, this kind of segues from it. It's for both of you because you both have different answers. I want to learn from you and the, the, the people who are watching want to learn what the process is from hearing God for the big things. Like before you walk, before you go on your walks or, prof- or the trips, prophetic trips, how did the Lord let you know? You know, did you have a vision um, a word of knowledge, a dream, and was there ever a confirmation needed? Did mm-hmm. Sandy get separate words from you? And um, did it start with John? Did it start with Sandy? And Sandy, how did you receive the word? I'm real curious, so if you could answer that. <laughs> Those are really good questions. And um, on the big things, there was always lead up maybe a sense that God was calling us to something big, an uncertainty as to what that might be about, a tremendous, I call it pounding the pavement and praying, what are you saying, God, what are you doing? And then um, maybe bursts of vision. Um, And then usually I have to pray for interpretation, what does this mean? Um, And then I pray always for confirmation. And I always believe too on the big things that we have to be in agreement. Um, and confirmation has always come, and, um, and we've always been in agreement on the big things, and she can talk about that. Uh, and then you, you step out in faith and do the thing that you believe God is doing. Mm-hmm. Now, one example would be... Um, I want to say, too, you've always walked in submission. In submission, yeah, always. So that he, we have a fellow who we consider our pastor, who was our pastor for years and years, and 
John, whenever he would get one of these big crazy ideas, because they sound pretty crazy, I'm going to walk from Portugal to China, right? You know, he would always take after the process of submitting it to the Lord and you know us being in agreement. He would always, in that process, take it to the the um, his pastor and Leadership. submit it and say, "What do you think?" and get you know get that prayer confirmation as well. So I can give you an example. I think this is a good one. Um, you know, there there was a there was a time when I think you you mentioned it. We went around the world by faith, and we had quite the um, experience along the way. I mean, you could write a book or two just about what happened. Which you are, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> and um, it began. Um, I was pastoring a church in Hudson, Wisconsin. It was actually my first pastor, and I had taken a short-term mission trip, mission trip, mission team down to Haiti. And so um, at the time, our church was involved in a building project. We were meeting in a school and we, you know, we, were, we purchased a plot of land and we're gonna build a building. So I'm in Haiti and out of the blue, this is how it began, out of the blue, um, the Lord just spoke to me and he said, lay it, lay it down and come follow me. And it was like, well, this is an inconvenient time to lay it down. I knew he was re <laughs> referring to the church but it was it was like um, it was like the Lord was emphatic. Lay it down. I want you to come follow me. So I, I went back to the church and I prayed about this. And I, I mean, do I share this with our elder board? And finally, I did. And um, it was a little nerve wracking. But it, we had such a good relationship that they said, you know, we really sense this is God. We don't want you to go. We love you, but we really sense this is God. And um, so we ended up. Laying, you know, laying the church on the altar, and um, we stepped out into the unknown, and that was difficult because I, I know God is saying, "Follow me," but He kept saying, "You know, Abraham really didn't know where he was going either, did he?" And so we stepped out into the absolute unknown, and then an amazing thing happened. Um, I, I, I was out prayer walking, and I had a a vision. This is what leads up to our going around the world. I had a vision where. It was like two angels were walking towards me, and I was standing by the St. Croix River uh, in Wisconsin. And so all of a sudden, I'm like caught up in the spirit, and I'm taken over the ocean in the spirit to Europe, and I'm over over what Frankfurt, Germany, and I'm looking down on a great big um, auditor a big auditorium, or what do you call it, a um, complex uh, with a dome, a domed complex. And I mean, I'm seeing this as if I were there. And then the next thing I know, there was an, I'm inside the complex and I see this old man and he just looks at me and he said, I want to fill this place. And, that, and it, it, it lifted. Well, the next day in the mail came a flyer for a Reinhard Bonnke Eurofighter Crusade. And on the front page of the, well, on the front of the flyer, it was like a four page flyer, was a picture of that dome. And I mean, I had deja vu tingles going all over me, like, man, I was just in that place. And so I began to pray. I said, Lord, I believe you want me to go there. I believe I'm meant to be there. But how am I going to get there? And, um, you know, and it was in this, this conference was in like August. And so the next thing that I know is I'm just pleading with God to provide the money. And the, the, you know, maybe a third of the funds that, that were necessary came in and the plane is leaving that day and I'm out in the woods and I'm saying, God, I'm supposed to be in Frankfurt. I don't understand this. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, if you had your ticket, where would you be? And I about fell over because I knew where I would be. I'd be at the airport. But I had told God earlier, I said, I don't want to ever go to the airport without a ticket expecting you to show up. <laughs> Well, that's exactly what I had to do. Yeah, never, tell, never put these conditions on God. That so, never works well. No, this, so we got, backfire. We drove to the airport. I have maybe a third of the necessary funds, maybe not even that much. Um, we drove to the airport, and um, I'm talking to the, um, the ticket agent, and um, I said, you know, I've got this much money. It was a charter flight to Frankfurt, and no, we, we can't do that. And so, and so they, they, they closed the, the ticker, ticket counter down, turned off the lights, everybody's gone. And Sammy looks at me and she says, honey, I think we need to go. 
something rose up in me and I said, I'm not leaving this airport until that plane's off the ground. Well, right then, um, that ticket agent came back down the, the dark hall. She saw me and she says, how much money do you have? And I said, I've got this much. And she goes, they had, by the way, delayed the plane for some reason. She said, I'll let you on, but there's no guarantee you'll ever get back. Right. I'll let you on for half of what you have. Yeah, said. for half of what you have. It was a sun country. There was an empty seat, apparently, and they're going to fill it. Yeah. So I get on the airplane. I don't have money. I don't have money. I mean, I have, she took half of what I have, and what I have left is not enough to get back, let alone right. go to the conference, let alone to find motel accommodations or anything. Right. Around. He's going to be gone a week, isn't that right? Yeah. Me and the three kids are like, we'll never see you again. <laughs> so I got on the airplane, and I heard the voice of the devil, and he said, I got you now. And then, but the Lord said, no, I'm in this. So I get to Frankfurt. And um, <laughs> amazing things happened. I said, Lord, I really could use a banana. And somebody came up and gave me a banana. And then I said, I really need a place to stay. And somebody heard me talking, speaking English to someone else. And they go, you know, we really need help. I go, they were from America, a team. I go, with what? They go, we've got this 12-year-old kid. And we don't have a chaperone. And they won't let him in the hotel without a chaperone. And we have no one to stay with him. You speak English. You're a pastor, right? I heard you say something about that. So would you be willing to oh sh be our goodness. chaperone, join our oh. team, and, 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 and of course you can stay at the motel. Well, it was this beautiful, like Canadian wow. rail, railway hotel or something, right across the, the, the campus. And so From I had, the dome where the... Yeah, wow. and then the Lord said, volunteer your time, which I did, and that, unbeknownst to me, gave me meal tickets every day. And so every need was met. Well, then I went back to the airport to fly home, and, um, and uh, I... I had this much money left, and um, the German ticket agent, he just looked at me and said, no. no. And he walked away. And I, I, I didn't know what to do, and the Lord just spoke to me again. He said, hold your ground. And I went back, and I just, he came out. Again, it was like, a, I was, everyone was gone. And he goes, yeah. And I go, I need to be on that airplane. And so I said it with complete confidence and peace. I need to be on that airplane. And he just looked at me. And without saying a word, went into the back room, came out with my ticket. And I got on the airplane and I came home and what had happened at the conference was life changing because the Lord, I, I, I'm an usher and I'm at a Reinhard Bonnke conference, Eurofire conference on the Holy Spirit. And I heard the Lord say, pay very close attention to what you're about to hear. Lauren Cunningham was about to speak from Youth with a Mission. So I was in that session and he, what I heard him say was there are two types of people, there are pioneers and there are settlers. Yeah. Which are you? And the Lord just said, you're a pioneer. Yeah. And I'm calling you to pioneer. Absolutely. I'm calling you to break ground, to go where no man or woman has gone before. And John, trust me. And so I came back fired up. And then the Lord began to speak into my heart about stepping out in faith and going in deep into Europe. And I had a sense we may end up going all the way around the world. Now, I submitted that to my leadership at the church. I went to Sandy and I said, this is what I believe the Lord is saying. And we were walking, she and I were walking along one day praying about it and she had a, a vision. Yeah. And she saw the angels of the Lord. Well, I was, these were my years of fear, right? The children were small, three, five, and seven. And, you know, these were just my years of, oh, I'm going to be a bad mother. What if I'm not providing for my kids? You know, just, you know, real years of insecurity as, as a young mom and all that kind of thing. And years of, gee, can I really trust God? This is crazy. You know, I knew I was up for an adventure with the Lord, but, ah, this is terrifying. And he's like, yeah, we're supposed to go around the world um, by faith. And like, around the world by faith. We don't know anybody around the world. But, you know, how is it all going to happen? Oh, it's such an unfolding story. So I'm like, God, please speak to me. Because, you know, I, I know this is a man of faith, but I just need a word. Yes. I need to hear from you yeah. because this is a big thing. This isn't just trusting you for peanut butter. You know, this isn't just trusting you for taking a, a camper van and driving down into Mexico. We had, I mean, we'd done some things. We'd left the church, which was a salary, right? So we'd left our salaries and just our little suitcases and out we go. You know, I had learned to trust God step by step by step. Now this is a much bigger thing thing putting my kids on an airplane flying 
flying to Europe, flying to England, and trusting God that he was going to take us around the world by faith. We had we ended up with, what, $200 in our pockets and a mandate to go around the world, a mandate to go to Moscow well, and prophesy. And like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. way beyond my pay grade for faith. So I'm like, Lord, it was all an unfolding thing, you know, that came about. But... Lord God, you've got to speak to me because I need something to go on here. And I did receive a a vision, and I'm not as much given to visions as this guy is, but a, a vision of a big angel, and he picked us all up, so the three kids under one arm and John and I over the uh, under the other arm, and flew across the Atlantic Ocean and put us down in England. And it was it was like, okay, okay, God, okay, God, <laughs> I'm willing to trust you. But again, my fear level was still, you know, just about there, you know. But I'm willing to take a step just above that fear level and trust you, Lord. And so I had that to go on. And we hadn't, um, so my, you know, my mentor and my pastor at the time was Pastor Alan Langstaff from Australia. And he calls me up about the same time without knowing what we're thinking. And he goes, John, um, I I think I have a word for you. And he said, I I think you're meant to go around the world. Oh, my. At the same time, I get a, I get a, a vision myself of, There's an old yo-yo trick, you know, yo-yo, right? Mm -hmm. It's called around the world. And the Lord, that picture came into my mind, around the world, around the world. And um, I felt the Lord was saying, you know, this indeed is me. Now, here's the thing. So we stepped out in faith and we're we're, we're figuring we're going to go, I think it was um, October 5th, 1987, I think. Um, And so we've set a date to go and... Now, I'm not exaggerating. One week before departure date, I had one dollar. And that was scary. One dollar. And um, we ended up, I was, I was selling roses in a rose truck. I did that. You know the rose day. man out here? Yeah. yeah. I worked for a rose man for a day or two, and I made like $80, and we ended up spending that on milk and food for the kids. So I had one dollar. And it was a real test of our faith. And I said, Lord, we're leaving in a week. What do, what do we do? And I'm not going to make an appeal. And so it was a test. And, and the strangest thing, um, that week saw an influx of money. And people, we were staying with friends at the time, and people came knocking on the door with money. People who owed me money gave me the money they owed me. And resource began to come in, but we still didn't have enough, like two nights before departure. And I get a phone call from a... From enough a, for five one-way tickets to England. Yeah. Right. Let alone getting ourselves through Europe. And no, we're just looking for five one-way tickets to so, England. <laughs> so here's an, another test of faith. And so... Um, Let's say we're leaving on a Monday morning, so like on Saturday morning, I get a call from a fella, and he goes, look, John, you're leaving in a couple days, right? And I go, yeah. He goes, my wife really needs ministry. Would you be willing, could we come over like tonight and just spend time? And that's the last thing I wanted to do, right? Because I'm all like tense and... I said, yes, yes, we'll do that. Well, he came over and we had a wonderful time of ministry with her. And then, this is exactly what happened. He's walking through the door, and he he looks at me, and he goes, you're leaving Monday morning, right? And I go, yeah. He goes, I just had the craziest idea. He said, I own a, um," he was a mechanic, but he owned a um, a service station uh, where they did mechanic mechanic work. And he says, I've got a car. Um, How are you getting out to New York? Because that's where we were going to catch our plane, because that's where the cheapest planes to Europe went from. He said, how are you getting out there? And I, I said, I don't know yet. Now, this is like Monday and this is Saturday night. He goes, I have a car. He said, I'll tell you what, it's a good, it's, it runs great. He said, I will give it to you and the title card. Just show up Monday morning and um, I'll, I'll, I'll deed it over to you. You drive it out and sell it. Okay. So we, we show up Monday morning 
and he gives me this car. I think it was a station wagon with the title card, signed it over. And then another party gave me their credit card and said, use this for motel room on the way to New York and just mail it back. It's unusual too. So we drove out to New Jersey, near New York, to, to fly out of the New Jersey airport, and uh, the strangest thing happened. So it was foggy. We couldn't really tell where we were. I didn't even, you know, pre-GPS. Wasn't even sure where the airport was. We show up at this like Motel Six or something, and the, the, the you know the check-in the check-in counters is behind bulletproof glass. It was that kind of a place, and I <laughs> I pull up and I roll down my window and I said, well, we would like to spend the night. Do you have room? He goes, yeah, it'll be whatever, fifty-four bucks or something. And he goes, and then I said, listen, uh, we're going to try to sell this car tomorrow. Do you know where I might go? And he looks at me and he goes, I'll buy it. <laughs> You drove here from Minnesota. He says, I'll buy it. It was run. I go, well, don't you want to look at the car? He goes, well, I see your license plate. You just drove from Minnesota, so it's got to run. I'll buy it. How much do you want? Uh, I don't, uh, Sammy, what do we want for the car? <laughs> right. So We I, still needed two tickets. We had three one-way tickets, and we needed two tickets, so we added up what that would cost, and we said, I think I think we needed $700. I forget so said, the amount. Yeah. But it, so he bought, he shows up the next morning, like at nine o'clock, gives me cash for the car. I give him the, and then they, they had a shuttle over to the airport. The airport, no. you know, to be across the road. We were like, found a hotel that was across the road from the airport. <laughs> we were, Whatever. It was in the fog. I didn't know. Yeah, we were we right were... across from the back before GPS. All right. And so we got over to the airport. Now we have cash <clears throat> to buy the tickets. And again, God moved. And there were, I, I, I this, this this guy comes over and starts talking to me. It turns out he was a professional golfer um, or semi, I think professional. Anyway, he, he you know he had his clubs and everything and he took a liking to our kids and he went and bought them, I don't know what, he bought them things and the Lord just spoke to me. He said, I'm not only taking care of you, I'm taking care of the kids. So we got on the, got on the airplane and somebody had given me the number of a fella who lived in London, in well, in Rochester, near London anyway, just south of London. So we, we contacted him, and sure enough, yep, we can, we, can, we can stay there. And we didn't really tell him what we were up to other than we're from Minneapolis. You know some friends of ours, and we're on our way into Europe. And so we flew over there. This man's name was Jock, and he puts us up in his house, and we met a gal. And again, this was strange. And um, she had just been in the United States on vacation. She was a police officer, but there had been a hurricane in, 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 in London, and it was, a, it was an unusual anomaly, an unusual storm, and it blew a bunch of trees down and damaged her apartment. So because of that damage, she came back from vacation, couldn't live in her apartment because of the rain damage, ends up in the same place where we are. Well, guess what? We get to talking to her, and she, against all logic, she says, I think I'm, I think I'm supposed to drive you into Europe. Next thing we know, we're in her car, and we drive into Europe not knowing where we're going. We do not know where we're going. The Lord began to speak to me. And so we were in... Um, we had a mandate around the world by land, by faith. So we, we knew we, were, we had to go by land, and we were going to get we, there. We don't, know, <laughs> we don't know where we're going. We really don't know where we're going. And people had all kinds of ideas. And the Lord kept saying, I'll show you where you're meant to go. And so anyway, we were driving, we drove into Holland and then the Lord spoke to me again and he said, go to Amsterdam and I will speak to you there. And I felt like Elijah the prophet, you know, he went here and then he went there and then he went there. And so we went to Amsterdam and we were at the YWAM base. They, they, they graciously put us up and I'm in the facility and a man's walking down the hallway and it turns out he was a cook. Anyway, he got next to me, he pauses, he stops, he looks at me and he goes, I think I know who you're meant to meet. Now, we, I don't know how he knew what we were doing or what we were about. I don't remember any of that. All I know is he said, I think I know who you're meant to meet. And it was a guy named John Kuhn who worked out of Germany and went behind the Iron Curtain. And so the Lord just spoke to me and said, that's the address. That's the one you need to meet. I just knew that I knew that I knew. And so we got back in the car and we headed to Germany and we, we, we tracked him down. And he said, nobody finds me. Nobody, unless God sent them. Oh, wow. And then he told us, he said, I think you're meant to go into Reichenau, into Austria. I mean, and so we just felt, yeah, that's what God is saying. And so we drove, we continued driving after we spent a couple days with him into Austria, 
we ended up at a YWAM base in a little town called Reichenau, and now we are up against a barrier, a wall, because we're out of money, there's no way forward, there's no way backward, we don't really know anybody, and it's it's before the internet, right? right. And so there we are. It was November, and we heard a word from the Lord, go to Moscow and prophesy. Well, that, that came while we were there at, at Reichenau. Yeah, at Reichenau. So we're there. But it's November, and like, you know, that's like Siberia, <laughs> November, right? Well, it was. <laughs> well, did, when you say you heard from the Lord, you know, he was speaking to you and you were doing this, would there be like, well, I shouldn't even ask this. Of course there were confirmations all along the way. Well, <laughs> He was meeting you every, every yeah, step it, of the way. It was just, it was strange. It was like, it was like the voice of the Lord in my head. Go to Amp, very clear. It was not, it wasn't, it's like, yes. It was like a command. Go to, go here, go there. Or just to, like with that, that address, just a real inner knowing. Um, yeah, this is it. All of this other stuff. So we got into Reichenau and we're out of money. There's no way forward. And that, that's where we were really tested. And so we don't even have enough money to pay YWAM. They're charging whatever, $25, $30 a night, $40 a night for hospitality there. I didn't tell them we didn't have any money. Yet. And so we're really dependent. And we went into a three-day season of prayer and fasting. And she would fast, or four days, I forget. She would fast one day. Then I would fast, and she would fast, and I would fast. So maybe it was four days. I don't know. And, um, and then there was a breakthrough. And what, what happened was I was asked to speak at the YWAM base on prayer on a Friday night. And a Lutheran pastor is there. And he takes me aside, and he goes, he goes, yeah, yeah. He said, we have been praying that a couple would come to our church. A family. Or a family and teach us all about the Holy Spirit. Oh, we, we, we are so hungry and we are so thirsty. We think it might be you. And so we said, sure, we'll do that. We ended up spending the entire winter and early spring with them in a big manse. They call it Parsonage a manse. And God opened the door for ministry all over. I mean, in Austria, in Germany, I went into Hungary, I went into Romania. Um, and it was just a powerful time of ministry where God was filling people with the Holy Spirit. I'm not exaggerating. You might have 20 people and it would be just like that. It was like the book of Acts. Oh. And then during that time, that's when the Lord said, I want you to go on to Moscow and prophesy. Well, so Moscow takes us further into into Europe. Now we're heading towards Asia. And again, we don't have money to do this. And how are we going to do it? We, it's like, this is so over my head. Well, we, we found, we, we heard that there's a German tour group that was going to take the Trans, Trans-Siberian Express across Russia, starting in Moscow. And uh, we saw this advertised at a tourist agent, in the agency in, 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 um, in Vienna. And so we ended up booking ourselves on that. And the monies came in. Um, I needed a down payment of like, uh, of like say six hundred dollars or whatever it was, and it, it, I get the call from Vienna because we were staying just outside of Vienna. I get the call that your 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 tickets are here. You need to come, you know, with at least the down payment, and I don't have it. And right there's a knock at the door, and some lady came in. She says, "I just felt God to, led of God to give you this money. It was the mo exact amount of money I needed." And so we got on a train. I go down. Pay anyway, yeah. we ended up. We ended up in Moscow. He walks in with the money. He says, oh, thank you. Walks out to yeah. go pay the Got bill. Got on a went, like went down, like, went down to, actually it might have been to pay for the tickets. Yeah. So we end up in Moscow. And by now it's June. So it's a little, the weather's a little. Messy. And the Lord had, the Lord had, you know, he had spoken to me in, 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 um, in, 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 um, in Reichenau, that uh, Austria, that you know, prophesy in in Moscow. So we got there. What, I mean, what does that mean? Pro Go to Moscow and prophesy. Okay. So, <laughs> well, Sandy and I, on the street corner. And yeah. Yeah. Well, Sam, I mean, it's like you know. I think. Okay, God, you're going to a lot it of lengths to have childlike faith. It's like you know, ah, I don't know, you know, just go for it. So we got into we got into Moscow and we were walking across. A, a big bridge right downtown. And um, I, I was tapped tapped on the shoulder. And I turn around and there's a, two ladies there. And 
one of them, and I'm thinking this is KGB because we know we're being, you know, watched. There's no, there was no doubt. We, we, this was we the knew we were being era. watched. Anyway, yeah. I'm tapped on the shoulder, and this lady says, um, "You're speaking English." I go, yeah. She goes, "Oh, we want to learn English. Can we spend some time with you?" So we we said, "Okay." We just felt, yeah. So we went to Gorky Park and hung out with them. And the short of it is. It they, was two women. She and her that spoke very good English with their Russian husbands who didn't speak English. And they wanted us to maybe meet. Anyway, yeah. she she was the director of the Moscow Zoo, and the other lady had some. She taught English at the University of Moscow. And they wanted. So to, the two women were very, you know, had very good English. It's something to do with our English, and so we ended up <laughs> meeting not only the two ladies but their husbands, and then we find out they're Jewish, and it was like an explosion of prophecy in me and without premeditation without giving it much cognitive thought I just began to share how God loved the Jewish people had a plan for them and I went on and on and on and on the whole afternoon I talked he, to, all he did the whole afternoon was prophesy to them about their Messiah yeah. and about how the Jesus loves the Jewish people and it was just flowed scripture was just flowed from him to these two Jewish families they got down on their knees the two ladies and their husbands. We took them to our hotel room. And asked Jesus to come into their lives. Oh, wow. Yeah. They recognized yeah. him as their Messiah. And this, I mean, with tears. And this was, they humbled themselves. And they were, that's why God sent us to Moscow. And um, Go to Moscow and prophesy. Please go to Who Moscow and prophesy. That meant, you know, proclaim Jesus to Jewish people. And they would wow. receive him. Oh, that's pretty good prophecy. You know, I just so, remember that verse, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yes, yeah. the spirit of Jesus. I hadn't thought of that. Yes. So we, we make, then we're, we're back on the Trans-Siberian Express, and we make our way all the way to Beijing, and on the train we met a, um, a woman who had a doctorate in physics, and she had been teaching she was in... a Chinese woman. She spoke English, Russian, and Chinese. And she had been mm. teaching in, in, in um, Austria, and when we got to Beijing, she told one of her doctor, doctor the professors that worked under, under her, her a, a doctor in training kind of guy. Um, she all she said was, "You take good care of them." And so, for the next we we were there for like four days, and he just took us everywhere and just explained so much. It was just a god thing. And then eventually we made our way on down to Hong Kong, and um, there's a whole story there as well. Because God did a miracle en route to Hong Kong. But we, this is how the thing ends. So we're in Hong Kong, and um, it's time to fly home. And monies had come in. Like, for instance, a friend of mine was in a car accident and got a settlement, and he decided to give us some of the money. It's in my bank account back home, but I have no way to access it. And so we're in Hong Kong, and we don't have enough money to get on the airplane. And we're, we're like there. And so... It was the days where we did have a debit card, yeah, but, $300. but you could take out a hundred a day or something, right. you know. So we had tick. We had to buy five one-way tickets from Hong Kong to L.A. or to Minneapolis or whatever for the family. It was going to be more than a hundred bucks, that's for sure, right? And I didn't know there was a limit, so I gave them the debit card, and then they they took our luggage, put our luggage on the, on the plane, and we're walking towards the gate, and we hear this. Mr. Halverson, Mr. Halverson, and I went, your, your card no work, your card no work. Well, what are we going to do? Our luggage is gone. The plane's getting ready to take off. They're telling me, my, and I, I just looked at this guy and I go, can we, can we fly now and pay later? <laughs> <laughs> Family of five, can we fly from Hong Kong to Minneapolis so, now and pay you later? They said, <laughs> they said yes, you can. What? But when you yes. get to Minneapolis, you'll you know we'll 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 wire ahead or whatever, and you'll be met there by um, an officer of the company. And that will make make sure that you pay. Sure that we won't give so, you your luggage till you pay. So we flew all the way across the Pacific back to Minneapolis. It was late at night, maybe ten o'clock. I got off the airplane. Night. There's nobody there. My luggage nobody is all there. there. There's our and I finally tracked them down. We could have easily left. I think Walked it was Northwest Oregon. How would you live with yourself if you'd done that, right? <laughs> no, so it, so I contacted them and, and yeah, this lady. We had to find them. We we're looking. Who can we pay? What do you mean? Who can you pay? You know, go home. We're like they've never heard of that before, so, right? So the one of the representatives, I think it was Northwest Oriented, came up and she goes, 
You did what? <laughs> and I said, we owe you for five tickets. For, I said, we just got they here let from us, Hong They Kong. let us fly and said we could pay rent. They go, we can't even do that. They don't even let employees do that. she says, tell that. me again, what? <laughs> I explained it all. And she just looked puzzled. And she goes, you must really have lucky stars behind you. I said, it's God. And then I wrote. We had a check, which I guess, or Somehow I don't know how, we were able or someone to pay. brought, whoever picked us up might have brought my checkbook, I don't remember how that worked, but we were able to pay them, mm -hmm. and against all odds, we made it, we, you know, we went around the, went around the land and around the world around and made the it world by land, by, by land. land, by land. You know, I had always wondered, why on earth is God calling us around the world by land? Like, what is this? You know, why would God go to all these lengths to to do this in our lives. And he said, well, I just think we need world vision. I thought, well, boy, that's the one way to get world vision. We certainly got a lot of that. But years later, yeah. it was in 2008, then we realized he was called to walk that same route that we oh. had done by land. We had done it <laughs> by car, by train, always by land. But now he's called to walk it and it yes. all began to make sense. It's the level after level after level. He, he gives you enough faith to do what he's calling you to today. Once you do it, you walk in obedience, you see how faithful he is. Then you have enough faith to take the next step. What? Absolutely. Walk from Portugal to China? <laughs> but there was that level of faith. You saw that he provided. How much did he provide? He's so marvelous. He's so wonderful that of course you can trust him for the next thing. But it's always the edge. It's always like, okay, now I'm gonna trust you for this. Woo! And he's so faithful. Sandy, can I ask, did you ever get to the point where faith triumphed over fear and you didn't have to battle it? Well, I did when uh, that man, that prophet oh, okay. in Ireland came to me and then it became easier, far easier. Um, and I also had something woven into my spirit when I was little, when I was small. Uh, my mom had left the family. She had what I call abandoned us. And so I had made an inner vow. I will not be like my mother. I will never abandon my children. I will meet all of their needs. And I had like this inner, um, the enemy had woven a lot of fear and a lot of stuff into my spirit that needed to be unraveled. And along the way, the Lord was very busy unraveling that so that I was set free from inner vows that I had made. And if you make inner vows, I will never do this, I will never do that. The enemy has free ground because yes, you've taken yeah. your life out of the control of the yeah. Lord and you've decided I'm gonna be the master of my ship. Mm -hmm. This is what it will never happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so, the enemy gets ground in you and I had been along the way being set free from a lot of that inner stuff, that inner weaving that had bound me to fear. And so there was a lot of that because a lot of fear that I would, wouldn't be a good mother, that I wouldn't meet everybody's needs. Well, of course I wouldn't. That's only the Holy Spirit. How do us moms think that's us? That can never be us, right? And so I had been being set free layer by layer by layer at the same time. So well, God going, is so good. Going way back to the beginning, uh, when, we, when we were pastoring that church in, in Hudson, a lady, um, a well-to-do lady, she said, I would like to send you and your wife to Israel. I'm, I'm willing to pay, pay everything. So our, 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 our very first trip international out of the adventure States began in Israel. Well, Israel. I said, Sandy, so-and-so is willing to um, pay a pay for us to visit Israel. And she goes, take your mother. Yeah, I can't leave the children. I won't I'm leave the children. I'm not leaving the children. I will never leave the children, yeah. <laughs> right? She goes, oh. take your mother. I'm not going, or I don't want to go. And um, and it was fear. She was being fear-driven. Well, it was it was shortly after that, we were at a meeting, and, um, and the minister looked at her and said, I, I see fear. I just see fear. And he prayed over her. And something began to break something down. Began. So that she oh. was able to go to Israel. Well, it was in Israel that I began to really receive vision for international travel. I mean, you know, because I had been pastoring um, locally prior to that. And so uh, it all began in Israel. Well, you can see how the enemy was trying to capitalize yep. on fear right. to keep her from launching out into the deep. So. Well, and, and the 
last couple of weeks as we have been talking about faith and what we use the term robbers or what robs us of our faith and you know obviously fear has is one of them but you know in in listening to in listening to all of this there's several things that we have to you know we can really grasp is first of all our your surrender your willingness you know faith you 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 believed god for who he said he is and he will do what he said he would do you you didn't question that you 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 trusted him and you believed him to speak and to lead and that that is pop part of our journey with with faith is that believing him we believe him to be who he says he is mm -hmm. and then when he asks things of us it's out of that faith i believe you so i'm going to step into this even though yeah <laughs> you know yeah i'm going to step into this because i believe you and and so there's a choice there mm -hmm. you made a choice <laughs> to believe him for what he was asking of you for, for the provision of it, for the grace of it, for the strength, all that you were you would need in it, you know, provisionally as well as emotionally and spiritually, you trusted him and believed him for it and then and made that choice. Yeah. And I think that's a key that God we faith increases as we step into the experiences, but it has to first start with that choice. I'm gonna believe you, God, to be who you are. You've asked this of me. I'm willing. My life is yours. Just like you said in the beginning. My life is yours. I will do that which you ask of me. And, and so he, you not only were trusting him to meet every need and every provision, but he was trusting you because he knew you would say yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. It really does boil down to childlike faith. I mean, a, you know, a child typically will, will trust it. You know, trust their parents, um, trust his or her parents, and um, I, I don't know. I, I just, I've always found it easy to believe God. I just, I don't know. I, it's like, I just got a, a basic belief that God is good and God's going to do what He says He's going to do. The, the hardest part of walking by faith is is discerning God's will for yes. me, for me. Yeah. And that takes a lot of effort, and we've really worked on that over the years and had to struggle with that, um, because it can be a lot of resistance to hearing God's word, yeah. really. Um, and you know, I was telling you the story about going to the airport. Um, shortly after we did that, I gave testimony to the fact some other guy tried to emulate me, and he was he was kind of upset. He said, "I went to the airport. I really felt it was God, and nothing happened." Just I got stuck there. It Went without enough money and yeah. yeah. And what hit me was that he moved out in presumption. He was presumptuous. You you you've got to know that you know that you know you're hearing from God, and that is, you know, hearing from God is imperative. Faith comes by hearing. You've got to be hearing from God. And there's a lot of presumptuous pres presumption pres presumption out there. Um, and so we've really again um, we've made it our life habit really to pray a matter through before we attempt to step out in it but once we decide or discern something is really of god then it's like it's like okay god i know you're going to come through no matter what happens you're right. going to come through mm -hmm. yeah, you're, yeah. you're so good about that right yeah. right right there have been times so mary you asked something about um what my role had been in this whole matter. And there have been times, although he's the visionary, he's the guy that gets the vision and the calling from God, there have been times where I've had to say, yes, it's God. Yes, you're oh, supposed to do it. Where I, I was dragging my heels. Where he would be dragging his heels. Oh, I'm supposed to walk across America. I don't think I'm going to walk. I mean, yes, you're going to walk. Oh. Yes, it's God. Oh. So, because at a certain level, We've had years of this hearing from God. I see how the Lord works in his life. I see what this process is, has been. And so I've just got a full assurance. This last, the last two walks, he walked um, LA to New York City, and then he walked Miami to Seattle. And when, when he received the calling to do those things, he was hemming and hawing and, oh, is this really God? And I just knew, yes, this is God. <laughs> Yes, you've got to do it, you know. And so, poor guy. <laughs> oh, great guy. A lot of times, God has called us to do things 
that I haven't wanted to do. Um, so when know, we moved to Ireland, no, oh, he fussed. The oh, call he... of God isn't always <laughs> exciting. Time. It's like sometimes it's like it takes it takes raw surrender. Yeah. Um, you know, I knew that when God called me to walk from LA to New York, it was going to be a lot of work, a lot of work. And I, you know, at the time was like sixty nine years old, and. Um, you know, it, I mean, yeah, I was on the fence, and Sandy was like, "No, this is God. This is God. Go for it." Even you know, on his last walk from from Miami to uh, Seattle, I, I came down with COVID, and I was hospitalized, and there were probably weeks when I I would say, "Sandy, am I going to make it?" <laughs> I know God's called me, but am I going to make? It? I just needed that assurance. Mm -hmm. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. <laughs> yep. Keep going. Yep. Yep. In fact, I you know, she's the one who said. You know, it's time to start walking again, and I, I wasn't sure I wanted to because I was so so under it. And she said, "Let's do one mile, just one mile." This was during the COVID recovery, Woof. right? So I did my one mile, and and next day I did three, and I was like, and then I did six, and then I was like, just wore out. And she said, "You can do it, you can do it." And we finally got back into our mm -hmm. what uh, sixteen mile pace then, and six days a week. And, able to go all the way to Seattle. 3,567 miles from Miami to Pocket Beach, Seattle, in case you were wondering. Is there a, is there a prophetic, anything prophetic about the number? Oh, there is something oh, prophetic about the number. Don't get her going on that. Don't get me going on that. Sure. <laughs> oh my. He was, um, he believed he was pulling a cord of mercy across the nation. So, L.A. to New York, he believed he was pulling a cord of mercy. Miami to Seattle, he also believed he was pulling a cord of mercy. But this time it was going to plug into a power source and revival was going to begin to flow across the nation. So all the way across, I'm like, Lord, what is the power source? God, show us what the power source is. Well, the number 3,567 turns out to be in the Greek Strong's Concordance the bridal chamber, which in intercession terms is that place of intimate prayer wow. with the Lord Jesus yes. Christ. It is the number for the bridal chamber. And as we got, he completed that walk. I realized the power source is when the people of God stay plugged into that intimate yes. place of prayer yes. Uh, yes. in the bridal chamber. And that's where the power flows. And wow. as that, that intimate prayer, that power of intercession, the tears that are wept there in yes. that intimate place, yes. tears wept in intercession, tears wept for the harvest. That's where the power will yes. flow for the nation. Yes. An Amen. awakening, awakening of prayer, an awakening of intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. And revival is on its way. And so that was the prophetic significance, 3,567. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Come on, church. Pray yes. with tears. Pray with tears. Amen. Amen. <laughs> wow. And how intentional our God is. Oh, shh. You know, you know intentional to even yeah. do that. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it could have been one mile off either way, and it wouldn't have been the bridal chamber. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I know. Well, we are basically up in our time. Um, this has been amazing mm -hmm. to hear hear this and very, very encouraging. Again, that, that choice to trust him, that choice to step into what he's called you to, hearing his voice. Again, another, what you just said about pressing into him and being having that intimate relationship with him <clears throat> is how you hear him. Mm -hmm. It's how you yeah. hear him and how you get to know his voice. And, and, and did you find that with each decision to trust him yes lord i give you my life i trust you with this and i'm gonna believe you for everything we need in it did it get easier each time or huh. was each time just different no each, each time i mean whenever you step out to trust the lord it's difficult again it's like walking on water that never turns to ice however having said that i think you're able to believe god for more and more um, as you as you trust him for one thing then you can maybe trust him for two and then maybe three you, you know one thing will build onto the other um it, it's really important to recognize that there's all i think always a process to growing in faith it's not something that just is handed down to you on a platter um, That's right. 
if you trust God in the little things, he'll trust you in bigger things and then bigger things. The principle is that, you know, if you wisely invest the little bit you have, he will then give you more. Yes. And so I think when God realized that we would take our, you know, take these steps of faith, even though they might have been baby steps, he, he allowed us to take bigger steps and bigger steps until, you know, the day came when he was saying things like, um, go to the North Pole. It's like, ah, you know, go to the South Pole. Go to the middle of the earth, that kind of thing, you know. Um, and then, then again, I was stretched. So maybe we can talk about that at another time. But I think faith means S T R E T E C H. Is that how we spell it? <laughs> Stretch. Stretch. <laughs> faith doesn't mean that you can do it easy. Faith means yeah. I can't do it. I gotta trust you. <laughs> you know, we were we were we were talking about our our test of faith. In, uh, you know when we were going around the world in mm -hmm. Austria mm -hmm. and one thing that I didn't mention is that while we were praying and fasting <laughs> the Lord spoke to me um, one right. afternoon and he said you know you you how did he put it you you really honor George Mueller are you willing to live like him and it hit me like a ton of bricks it's like what God was saying is that Okay, there's no food for breakfast, but are you willing to trust me? And, and we were in that kind of a situation. There was no way forward. There was no way backwards. There was, there was no way out of this, but by divine intervention. And when I said, yeah, Lord, but, you know, help me, um, that's when provision just, just fell. And, and, the, and the way it began was I was asked to speak to um, some ladies at a Bible study. And there were maybe 15 ladies there, maybe 20. And, um, and I just, one of them like wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Again, it was like the book of Acts. And I went to pray and the whole room lit up with, I mean, people were just praying and tongues, hands went up. This was all brand new to them. It was like the book of Acts manifesting. Well, one of the ladies happened to be a very um, well-to-do woman. And she gave me a, a, a little bag of gifts for the kids with a card. I took it home, never looked at the card. I forgot about the card. It was I gave, a little bag of candy for A little the kids. bag of candy. I gave the candy to the kids. And um, finally, at like a day or two later, we opened up the card. And go, oh, there's a card. It had like 10,000 shillings in it, which oh. was $1,000. And that's the, that was the beginning of provision. Monies just began to come in supernaturally. We, we were able to pay off, you know, pay our debt at YWAM with no difficulty. And, um, and we had, I mean, it was, God just provided. But there was that test of faith. Are you willing to believe like George believed, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, okay. And I remember too seeing a picture, and I think Sandy saw it too. Um, it's like there was a hobby horse and we were riding it and the wind was blowing so strong, it was howling so strong that our bodies were literally being blown off the horse. And the Lord just said, hold on. It's a bunky bronco, hold on. And, and, and what he was saying is that you're involved in a test of faith right now. You've got to hold on and just believe me. And so we just held on, and then, and then the peace of God fell, and provision came in, and the rest is history. So. You know, and as much as he was doing intentionally in you and drawing you into that intimate relationship with him, growing you, stretching you, and all of that, the beauty of all of it is goes back to our, our verse, Arise, Shine, that in your yes to him, his glory was seen in you and through you for the sake of the world. Yeah. And that's what it's about. It's as, as much as he, he, he is doing in you and drawing us all closer into that intimate relationship with him. It's all in that communion with him and he overflows and we shine his glory yeah. so that others will see him and know him. Yeah. Arise, shine. Yeah. And you did just that. It's like we, we're not, we're, it's like, we're not, it's not God doing, blessing us in our thing. We're doing his thing. And when you do his thing, stuff happens. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's, that's good. good. So that's it's, so it's good. discerning what his thing is because yes. so many of us want to do our thing. I mean, I've been there, believe me. Um, but that's not where it's at. It's doing his thing. And that takes effort to discern. It's like, what is your thing? What is your thing for me? Um, and I'll tell you, God can... The Bible says in Daniel that those who know their God will do 
exploits. Stay strong, stand firm, and do exploits. Yes. And exploits are always outside your comfort zone. Yes. They're always something you can't accomplish on your own. That's exactly. why it's an exploit. But it those who know their God. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those yes. who know their God. Yeah. Amen. So we've all got a place. We're all start we're all at some level. If we're praying in the peanut butter, then believe God for the peanut butter, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all somewhere on this journey of faith. And as you believe God for what he's calling for you for right now, you'll see that he's faithful. You'll see that he's faithful. It's that childlike trust. Mm -hmm. And then you'll just see him provide. And, you know, it'll probably be the ninth hour or the eleventh hour or the last minute or beyond the last minute, what you thought was the last minute, right? But he will always provide. And then he'll take you to the next level. So it's an unending adventure. Amen. So it starts with peanut butter. Started with <laughs> peanut butter. And, and it, it ends with bigger things. And um, so again, there's this process. And you can't circumvent it. No. Um, and um, it, it's just, you just grow in faith, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. So, uh, so the gift of faith is, it's like a burst of belief for a, a specific what we're talking about is more of a life of faith. Yeah. And it's a kind of a different animal, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's honestly, it's rooted in relationship. Yeah. With him. It's yeah. rooted yeah. in relationship with him. And out of that relationship with him, you know him, you know what matters to him. And in knowing what matters to him, you say, I'm it. I'm your guy. <laughs> I will step into this. <sighs> Provide, please. <laughs> and we know that it will. Well, we're going to close. If you wouldn't mind praying, um, whatever God puts on your heart to go ahead and pray out. Um, we so love to continue this um, again, if you guys are open to that. Because there's just been so much that God is speaking and saying through this mm. for us and, and for those watching and those that will watch. So... Go ahead and, and close us in prayer. And um, again, I encourage all of you watching to um, put any prayer requests that you want in the chat because we will pray for you. And this is going to be um, on YouTube, on the YouTube channel that you can go back and watch it and share it with others. So we're just we're going to close out in prayer, um, but you will see us again. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh, Father, <laughs> who art in heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed be thy name. Yes. You're an awesome God. You're seated in high places. Yes. And yet you're willing to cohabit with us. <laughs> it's amazing. You're willing, Lord, to walk out life with us. And we pray, Lord, that we would all grow in intimacy. Yes. Yes. Lord, there's often a barrier to intimacy. There's resistance to intimacy. There's a spirit element, Lord, that resists intimacy. And I pray you would break through that thing. And I pray that we would experience your Holy Spirit unlike ever before. I pray, Lord, there will be times when we're like, we're like over, overwhelmed with your presence. Mm -hmm. And Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, there's liberty, there's, yes. there's, there's just all kinds of good stuff going on. And I pray for more and more and more of your Holy Spirit. Yes. May we not be religious in name only, but God, may we be filled with your power, filled with yes. your life, filled with your, your, the dynamic of your nature. Just come and fill us again yes, and again and God. again. Yes, and again and again and again. I pray, God, that faith would will up, well up within all of our yes. hearts. Yes. And that, God, we would just have this attitude and aptitude to want to step out in your will. Yes. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not our will be done, but your will be done. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May you begin, Lord, to download what your will is for our lives. May we wake up yes. in the morning with, yes. with, with a sense about your will, not our will, your will. Yes. So, God, may we all grow. Yes. May we grow, Lord. May, you know, may the leaven of the Spirit begin to do its work in our loaf of bread, in our lump of dough, rather. In Jesus' name, God, Lord. Amen. Come, come, come by the power yes. of your Spirit. Yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I pray for, the, for, the, for just the little seeds that have been planted in us 
the little seeds of faith. May they begin to be watered yes. and may they grow yes. and may they, Lord, become a tree. Amen. <laughs> yes. May there be no stunted growth within us. That's right. We agree. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just believe you're calling us to take your words and speak them. Share your words with yes. those we meet. Yes. And Lord, you're calling us to a new level of faith of, and boldness, Lord, to speak to those we meet. Father God, to lift folks up in prayer. Father right. God, to That's enter right. deeper, Lord, into the realm of intimate prayer where we weep with tears of repentance and we weep for the harvest to be reaped. And not only do we pray, but we're willing, Lord, to be bold to take your word of life and speak it out, God. Father, I just come against any fear of man that would hold us back. And I just say, let uh, there be light and let our tongues be loosed Amen. in yes. the name of yes. Jesus, yes. that your yes. church Thank would you. carry the words right. of life right. to the lost. Father, that we stand up in faith and speak with joy and with love. God, seeing the lost saved. God, we need you. We love you. We thank you. You're sending us forth in power, in love, in joy, and in faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you again for joining us. Amen. It's been a, a privilege and a pleasure meeting you all again. Well, you certainly encouraged me, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know everyone else. Mm -hmm. Are you still going? <laughs>